Tera te kōrero rongonui i meana mā pango mā whero ka o ti te mahi. Hoe ko te kōrero a te kōwhiringa pōti i meana mā kahurangi mā kōwhai hoki e te iwi he whāri ki hou e rāranga hia nei. Welcome to Mata with me, Mihi Ngārangi Forbes. Brought to you by Te Māngai Pāho and the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Tonight we survey the new political landscape with commentators Tau Henare and Morgan Godfrey and get reaction from across the political divide. Aotearoa has a new centre-right slash far-right government in waiting and the most powerful government in the history of MMP has been crushed in the shifting tectonic plates of voter preference. Gentlemen, what are we looking at here? Political hellscape or utopia, Tau? Oh, same old, same old. Um, I, I, you know, the the, the last uh, twenty years of, of politics, in my opinion, has been man management, is man managerial capitalism. Um, they just manage, and there's nothing transformational, nothing, nothing new. So I'm not expecting any uh, transformational uh, uh, in the coming uh, three years. It, it, it'll same old, same old. Kapai and Morgan. I think it was a wipeout, but it wasn't a wipeout for the left, it was a wipeout for the Labour Party. So Labour lost votes to National, they lost votes to the Greens and they lost votes to Te Party Māori. So they have to figure out what they're doing wrong uh, in the centre, what they're doing wrong mm. on the right and what they're doing wrong on the left too. One party that did, did, did well, Te Pāti Māori, has managed to fight its way back from the political wilderness of 2017 to take four of the seven Māori electorates, while two more sit on a knife's edge, as the specials are counted. In doing so, Te Pāti Māori has extinguished two political institutions, uh, the Te Rikātenes in Te Taitonga and Nanaia Mahuta in Hauraki Waikato, whilst ushering in a new generation of Māori leadership. To discuss, we're joined now via Zoom by Te Pāti Māori's John Tamihere Tēnā, yeah, kia ora, kia ora, kia ora. Four seats and 2.6% of the party vote. Is this what was expected? Yeah, look, we, we were very intentional from the get-go. We um, we don't have the resources or the money. Uh, so on a cost-efficiency uh, basis of, of, and efficacy, we we are the most uh, productive and successful um, party uh, on the stage at the moment in regard to just straight investment. So if you look at us, um, we we took all our campaigning onto social media um, and on digital boards. Um, that played out well for us. We've got one of the largest Instagram uh, political accounts, followers, TikTok, um, and of course for the older groups, Facebook. So and that's where a lot of our playouts went. We, we were intentionally after our younger vote, 70% of our people are under 40, 25% under 50. And so we're building um, an intergenerational movement in terms of uh, support and capacity. And uh, Hannah and Doc uh, are the face of uh, that new era coming. Um, and you may not be finished yet. Half a million special votes to come. Do you have your fingers and your toes crossed for Tamaki Makoto and Te Tai Tokiro? I think just 400 votes in each. Yeah, look, I, I, both of those are still in play. And, and with respect, no one knows where those special votes are going to break. But what I'm quite upset about is that a lot of our people <clears throat> get sent to special queues uh, and just feel like they're second-class citizens lining up to vote, while others, uh, different colour, just uh, get tracked through and get better resourced. So we've got to do something about that uh, in the next election. Uh, and what and, and what are your suggestions? I saw um, Rāwari Waititi calling for a Māori electoral commissioner. Well, hey, if, if, the, if the mainstream system fails us, we stand up our own and it won't. And it happened in Koanga, Kura, Whare Kura, Wānanga. So if, if uh, Fana Ura, if, if mainstream fails us, we just want, I don't want parking money, I just want our own resources um, self-managed and uh, rather than embedded in their welfareism. So that's that's what Ra, what Ra what he says is uh, our go-to solution. You've got four, um, you're looking at a possible, you know, potentially two more, that's a that's a pretty serious um, number, six seats in there. Te Pāti Māori will be sitting across from the coalition, um, potentially who might be running a referendum on the treaty, introducing a gang prison, reforming the education system. What, what, what's your strategy? Oh, look, um, activism, as To will tell you, was uh, led out of urban Māori communities. And um, oh, I can, you can rest assured that um, Māori population won't lay down and watch 30 years of incremental adjustment, uh, which could have been carried out by way of revolution, 
uh, um, washed away, uh, as happened with The Voice in Australia. The tyranny of the majority uh, just just uh, cannot be uh, perverted by a small group called ACT. Have you heard from the National Party or has anyone in your team? Well, we're in Party Māori and no one swipes right for us, apparently. I don't know what that means, but uh, younger people would. So uh, getting a date on the other side of town is very difficult. When you um, consider, uh, you know, you've done so well in, in those four seats and two still to come, but when you look at Ikoro Rafati, it's uh, Winter Kushla, Tangaire Emanuel. Was it a mistake to switch out Mecca for uh, Heather Teo Skipworth? Oh, absolutely not. Um, we started our campaign off the back of uh, her crossing the floor to us. Uh, we got five weeks of cover to cover uh, uh, media. Even in the polls, which poll Pākehā preferences, not Māori, uh, we went up to 7% and uh, in two months in a row were kingmaker. So uh, she, she she had the courage to do the honourable thing, did it. She paid the price for that. Those, um, those Nāti proses have got something to offer. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're pretty well organised, the dirty rats, but um, that's my cousins. So uh, um, we wish her well, though, Kush. Uh, she's... But look, look, our candidates across the board are very capable in all parties. You know, Nanaya and, and Reno are, are very, very good people. They're just in the wrong party at the wrong time. You got any thoughts for Nanaya or Reno who have held those seats for a very, very long time? Those are the two first settlement tribes and have been out the gate for 30 years ahead of most other tribes. I would anticipate the Iwi leadership uh, would look after them and should look after them, and uh, if they don't, shame on them. Tēnā koe e John will uh, be in touch and talk over the next few weeks. Kia ora. That's a very good point, isn't it? Nanaya and Reno both um, come from the first treaty settlements in 1995. Do you think they'll be well looked after? Uh, like John says, they better, um, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's tough putting yourself in front of the cameras, in front of the party, mm. doesn't matter whether it's National or Labour, and when you've got the, the weight of history behind you and you, the weight of history is knocking on your, the back of your head going, don't screw it up, yeah. you know, give us something. Um, mihi atu ki, uh, ki ananaya, mihi no. But don't forget, it's not the first time that the Tirikatane fam family right. has lost a seat. Because in 1996, uh, Tutukawa right. beat Fetu. So, you know, um, that, that, that stuff happens in politics and we shouldn't um, be too fragile about it. Let's move on, let's look. Always keep your eye on the future. Yeah. Don't worry about what's going on in the past. What did you make of John Tamihiri's kōrero there? Do you, do you think they're placed well for those other two seats? or? Um, I was looking at the numbers the other day and Te Pāti Māori do six times better on the specials than they do on the day. Um, so whether that's enough to close 500 votes... Do you think this election it's going to be the same though? Because I can see, I can hear ACT talking about how they're going to get extra specials and the Nationals talking up, you know... The... Oh, yeah, yeah, they're just blowing smoke. They're blowing smoke. Um, we saw special. On the, yeah, we saw <laughs> on the day um, the people who were casting special votes uh, were Māori people because they weren't... Uh, on the printed rolls that day, the system had crashed. Um, so essentially, you know, if you're a Māori person who's, say, renting, if you're out of your electorate, uh, if you're enrolled at Nan Kōtō's house somewhere way down the other mm. side of the country, well, you're in that hour-long line to cast a special vote. Uh, so I think actually we'll probably see maybe this election uh, Te Pāti Māori is going to do better than they did in the past. Whether that's enough to close 500 votes, though, mm. I mean, I reckon there'll be dozens of votes between it either side, mm. whether it's Penny on one side or whether it's uh, Te Pāti Māori on what, the what other it, side. In will it push up their party vote enough to not create an overhang or are you... Oh, hopefully not. Hopefully not. The best possible scenario for Te Pāti Māori is that they have an overhang so that they win more electorate seats than they are entitled to on the party vote because that means they're more powerful because National is then deprived uh, of one seat so they have to go to Winston uh, and then Winston can drive a hard, harder bargain because he can say, "Wow, you know, it's looking dicey for you fellas." You Is that a me. good thing, Tay? No, no. Handing really. the handing no. <laughs> <laughs> leverage to Winston. Well, the thing is, you've got a by-election on the 24th of November that'll yeah. that'll guarantee uh, National an extra seat. 
still that's only 62. Yeah, yeah, but, but we don't, we, you know, like, like Morgan says, I mean, 400, we have 400 and 500 in front. It, it seems minor, but it's mm. actually not. Because let's not forget, you've got a bit of momentum, even though it's small, very minute momentum, it's still 500. You only have to win by one. Mm. Mm. What do you make of Hana Rafati Maipi Clark unseating Nanaya and then, you know, Taku Tafiris down into Taitonga? John Tamihiri says, you know, this is the new party Māori, is it? You know, on the, on the result, when I, when I was watching it, um, and I ex had to explain to my kids um, and to my mokos what a boil over was. And the win against Nanaya by Hama was a boil over. I didn't think that w it was going to be possible. Uh, so, so big ups to the Maipi whānau, uh, and they, they will be a cock hoop and, and, and well-deserved. Have you um, got any advice for Hana going into Parliament at 21? Oh, go for it. Go, go hard. Go hard or go home. I mean, do you want to spend 27 years in Parliament not doing anything? Mm. Or do you want to spend three years or six years doing something? Going hard. Mm. How do you think Te Pāti Māori could be effective in Parliament? Um, I think they have to, you know, do the JT strategy and they have to be loud, they have to be proud and they don't, they have to never stop because they're in opposition, they're not going to become ministers, uh, they don't want to become ministers and that's probably uh, precisely why they won actually because mm. they weren't necessarily just running against the National Party. They were also running against the Labour government and the Labour government's record. And so there was a mood for change among Māori too. It just expresses itself a little bit differently. You know. New Zealanders will go national for a mood for change, but for Māori voters, Māori electorates, you go TPM for if it's a mood for change. Well, uh, one of the night's big winners is the Green Party, who picked up uh, three seats, including Wellington Central, which was won by Ngāti Awa descendant, Tamantha Paul. I spoke to co-leader Marama Davidson and asked her if selecting rangatahi candidates was a deliberate decision. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly with our Māori and Pacific caucus, I must say, which we've now uh, more than doubled. <laughs> uh, so welcoming uh, Tamatha, Darlene, Kuhana and a Fessel, all super staunch, kaupapa-driven, community-led uh, people and that is absolutely, we are wanting, we know that we need to reach out into communities that maybe haven't traditionally supported the Greens or seen themselves in the Greens, but you have a look at our whole list that's coming in, uh, I think with the, with the six new MPs that we are welcoming in, um, mainly Brown, <laughs> Mainly Māori and Pacific, we've got Lan, who is uh, Vietnamese, uh, Whakapapa as well, and then we've got uh, Steve and Scott. So I'm really, really proud that we are purposefully wanting to broaden our presence. Yeah, I also asked Marama if she plans on sticking around for the long haul. Yeah, I am. And particularly because I think in some ways... <laughs> I just started feeling like maybe I'd found my stride a little bit. Um, and I think a lot of that was to do with I've had some of the most heinous experiences in the past three years, and especially in this year, the level of target and toxicity that has been thrown at me I've never experienced before. And I think, in a way, that actually made me double down even more. After I got over the mummy of it, I think I just decided, oh, well, nothing to lose now. They all take me so might as well just to tika to puno uh, so I I can see that I've still got passion and energy to support our collective voice the minute I don't feel that anymore I know will be my time to go if I'm not already forced out by other means. Yeah and lastly I asked Marama what some of the key opportunities will be for her newly enhanced team? Yeah definitely more select committees I remember over the past two terms with limited MPs We've had to uh, trade off between which select committees we're going to choose to have a voice on and which select committees we are just not going to have a voice on. And that's been really tough because a lot of our green priority issues are spread across many select committees. We are not going to have any hindrances, any restrictions on our truly independent voice. Uh, we are going to have a lot more time to be in the grassroots leadership communities 
to be able to strengthen the relationships that we've uh, worked so hard on for a long time. Uh, I can't help but I've accepted I've accepted what has happened in election, and now I'm fully looking at where are the golden opportunities. Now we know what we're dealing with. Where are the strengths and the golden opportunities? I see heaps, Mahi. I see heaps. Co-leader of the Green Party, Marama Davidson. Poe, what did you make? Do you think? How did you think Marama ran the campaign? Oh, I, I thought it was really good. I thought it was. I thought it was um, focused on their vote. You know, they don't worry about what what other people were saying. So, very similar to to Party Māori, and both both campaigns were actually run very very well. You know, a lot of people will think to themselves, "Pity the Labour Party uh, didn't focus earlier." Um, you know, and 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 um, they didn't grow their vote in, enormously, but they did win three electorate seats, and that's 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 unheard of. And so, uh, so big ups to the Greens, big ups to to Party Māori. Yeah, did you? Um, did it make you feel sad when she talked about how she's never experienced so much abuse in the last three years? No, didn't know. No, 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 it doesn't uh, make me sad. That's rhetoric, as far as I'm concerned. Christ. Um, I've, I've, I've been th through it in the 90s, for goodness sake, last century. And, and, and um, people say, oh, that was, you know, that was, it, it was tough. But if you're not tough enough, then you don't deserve to be there. Kapo, he's a hard man to <laughs> over here. Um, do the Greens have the opportunity to become the biggest left bloc? No, probably not. Um, after the specials come in, they'll probably just break that ceiling that they hit in 2014. So they'll be around 11 or 12 per cent, uh, but they haven't ever got higher than that. Um, so with a le weak Labour Party, the Greens are always going to do better. But Toe's right, they were on message. When uh, Chippy ruled out a wealth tax, the first thing the Greens did was say, we will bring one in. Uh, and so immediately those, um, those Labour voters crossed over to the Greens uh, and we saw their support shoot up. The real challenge for them is what happens uh, if there's a resurgent Labour Party? What happens to that mm. Green vote? So when Jacinda came in, the Green vote crashes yes. because we have a resurgent Labour. And then the ha same thing happens in reverse. So untethering themselves from each other If you look at some of those seats, key. you know, and people have raised this, like, why don't the Greens and Labour do a deal, and particularly in Mount Albert, you know, and it's still really marginal. Melissa Lee might take that seat, and Helen might well, wait, m might not because of Ricardo's got mm. 5,000 votes in there. But is it fair enough with the performance of the Labour that the Greens didn't do a deal? Yeah, good on the Greens. Seats? Good on the Greens for standing there. Um, I, I, I hate to say it, Helen's from Kawido as well, but She's a professional <laughs> Who loser. Who isn't? She's a professional loser. Um, she's, she's lost Auckland Central. She came so close to winning, the, losing rather, the seat held by Michael Joseph Savage, Helen Clark, Jacinda Ardern. Who could lose that kind of seat? <clears throat> Helen White could come close. So it's a real, that was just good on the Greens for standing because Labour should have done better and they know they should have done better too. The, the Greens also stood candidates in the Māori seats and I think Darlene Tana, you know, she took a fair chunk of them too. Yeah. Good on them for standing? Um, or should they have done deals? Yes and no. I mean, I, I, think, I think if you know you're not going to win, mm. then it's a bad idea. If you think you are, seriously think you are going to win, then... What well, they good. did win is that they've grown their party vote in the Māori seats. Why do you think that is? Oh, I, th I think it's time. I th oh, there, there's, a, there's a hell of a lot more young people now than there ever was. And, 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 and if you have a look at uh, Te Pāti Māori's strategy, like JT says, it was all focused on the under-50s. You know, and that's, and that, that's a, you know, as a 63-year-old, I think that's actually great. I think, well done, young people. You know, it's about time somebody, including yourselves, patted yourselves on the back for doing something great. Ka pai. Um, well, there's lots of questions about what this new government means for Māori, and last night I spoke to National MP Tamapotaka uh, to ask about his priorities. Well, I think we've been very strong on campaigning around uh, the economy and making sure we restore the economy, also law and order, health and education, and I've put in there housing as well. Uh, and... As we know, uh, the cost of living it deeply affects uh, all New Zealanders, but particularly Māori communities. Uh, and it's certainly troubling for me uh, the type of uh, economic and financial challenges that many of our whānau and communities have. Uh, so, in light of uh, where that where that lands, I think our aspiration and our intention to restore the economy 
and manage the cost of living better uh, is really focused on all New Zealand does. But for me, I look at how we can do that in a uh, in a very deliberate way, particularly for Māori communities. And you talked about with me uh, in previous quarter around the trampled floor, and disproportionately a lot of Māori are in that space. So making sure that we can uh, uh, curate job and business and other opportunities for Māori and figuring out how we can boost productivity with Māori agribusiness uh, and Māori businesses is something that I'm pretty enthusiastic about and hopefully uh, I can contribute to positively, not, not just in Hamilton West, but throughout the Motu and indeed overseas, actually. Yeah, we wanted to know what Tama had planned as, as well. So I also asked Tama if he had a bill he had been thinking about. Well, I've got a, a bill that I've been thinking about and sort of trying to articulate in my mind, and it's around just giving more development opportunities on Māori freehold land. Uh, that's certainly something I'm enthusiastic about. Now, Chris Finlayson and um, Sir Rolf Level, Joseph Mooney have all had a go at that, and I, I bring with it a little bit of a different dimension from the actual activation of development on Māori land with my um, previous responsibilities with PKW and other Māori organisations that I've seen that there are some things that have worked well and some things that haven't. Uh, and perhaps where we went to many years ago was um, uh, legislatively and regulatory driven, might sort of more in balance between that and development and figuring out how can we do that and give a bit of balance. Uh, but that's at the big Māori collective end. There's a whole range of communities that uh, in the Māori space that we deal with uh, as, um, as Māori. Uh, not just as a parliamentarian, but as governors and as uh, owners and beneficiaries and other things. And I've just seen some things that have gone really, really well and other things we could just do a little bit better. That was Tama Potaka, uh, Hamilton West MP uh, for National. Sounds like he's going to have a go at Te Ture Whenua. Sounds like he's going to um, uh, Is it do something death? for the minority of Māori. The majority of Māori live in the bloody city, for goodness sake. You know, we're at the coalface of industry, of unemployment, of education, of health, right here in Tāmaki. Not one of these MPs have jumped up and said, this is what we're going to do in Tāmaki, you know, for, for urban for urban Māori, mm. as a starter, for mm. goodness sake. Te Uruo Flavel had a go at Te Whenua Māori and it yeah. didn't go so well for him. Do you, how do you think it's going to work out for Tama? And, and you've worked with Tama, so you know him. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to, to hear what, what changes he's talking about. How is he going to manipulate uh, the, the, the same old let's open up Māori land for Marginal development? Land. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's not a you know, one of those uh, Glasgow leases, and <laughs> as you well know, you know, that... Um, so many ministers have come and gone, including myself, that have thought about how do we open up Māori land to mm. development. We heard him, uh, Tama, there talk about collectives, iwis, um, uh, iwi collectives, and I, I'm wondering, do you think we'll see the return of the big kind of iwi forum leadership that deals with national at that level? Probably, um, just because it's easier for national to go to one body than it is to consult with you know, urban Māori, iwi leaders, people who are disconnected, whoever else. But back to To's point, though, I think he's absolutely right. You know, we hear from Tama about uh, Māori landowners and unlocking development. But, you know, as someone who's got you know, shares and heaps of trust, our land trusts are doing fine. We've got dairy factories, we've got pine plantations, we've got leases with power stations. We don't need development to be unlocked. Where the worst uh, poverty is occurring is within urban Māori communities who don't have those things, who are ignored uh, by government and by uh, even by Māori leadership as well, which always looks internally rather than looking outside. So you're kind of saying that actually leave Māori business alone, it's doing fine, and actually look at the social issues that are impacting Māori in those communities. Exactly, exactly. Turn your eyes to Auckland, turn your eyes to Wellington, mm. to, to Hamilton, to Christchurch, to Dunedin, to those places. You know, don't look at the, the kawetos or the titekos or wherever it might um, be, because yes, those communities are are struggling, but we see in Auckland, especially South Auckland, West Auckland, things are so, so much worse and may get so much worse. Tama Potaka has been touted as the next, next uh, Māori Development Minister. Do you think he'll get it? And if he does, how will he deal with potential referendums on Te Tiriti? No, here's, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the question. Who else is there? Haere you know, Tehipango? Well, uh, did she get back in? She's on a knife's edge. 
Well, there you go. <laughs> um, look, it's got to it's got to be Tama in, in my view um, because he 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 fits all the, uh, the he ticks all the little boxes. Is it going to be lonely for him? Lonelier than when you were in there? Oh no! I mean, you make your own mates. You 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 make your own fun. Um, as I was always told about by my parents and my grandfather and grandmother, go outside and play. And 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 you created your own world. Well, you're you're in in a, in a right, in the right space to do that. Just don't screw it up. Well. People like Tama Potaka with his uh, law background, his work in treaty and whenua and Māori organisations, will they have much of a say if there is a referendum on te tiriti and those kinds of act policies? Oh, Tama won't get a word in. You know, it's not his choice whether they have uh, a referendum on te tiriti or not. Uh, it's the choice of Chris Luxon, David Seymour, uh, and maybe Winston Peters, although we had Shane Jones on the news last night saying that New Zealand First will absolutely oppose uh, unleashing the tetidity from its historical moorings, I think, but I've, were I think, his words. so I think we've already heard from uh, Luxon that he's walking that backwards mm. and he's not prepared uh, to... I mean, what he's not prepared to have is civil disobedience on any scale, and, and I think he's right. OK, well, among the Māori MPs exiting Parliament is Tāmati Kofi. He was given a last-minute call, a call up to run in East Coast after Kitty Allen resigned, and I asked him what he'd learnt during his time in Parliament. Significant learnings from me. Uh, I think that everybody should stand for public office if they get the chance to. It tests your everything, your relationships, your patience, uh, your sincerity, your authenticity. Uh, so I, I believe that. Um, when I first came in, I was green as, knew nothing about politics in 2014 when I first stood for the Rotorua seat, uh, missed out terribly that time, won in 2017, lost my seat in 2020, but won as in coming in on the list, and this time uh, a loss in a general seat. So I've come full circle, and I'm a, I'm a stronger person for the experience. Yeah, also, uh, uh, also out of Parliament is Shannon Halbert, Soraya Picky mason and of course Nanaya Mahuta. Coffee had this to say about his colleagues. Um, specifically to Nanaya, she is a powerhouse and I gave her a call yesterday just to have our little debrief. Um, you know, what she hasn't experienced in her 27 years of politics um, isn't really worth it <laughs> with the paper that it's written on, but she's been through everything and uh, I know that she's another person that's walking away, albeit after 27 years and not wanting it to finish this way, um, you know, knowing that the people speak and uh, uh, the people spoke when they put her in back in 1996, uh, the people spoke again over the weekend and that's that's okay. Uh, that's the nature of this political game that we, that we play. Um, Reno the same. He's given everything uh, in the time that I've known him as part of our Māori caucus. Uh, he is a resilient person. So is Nanaya. I don't think you can go through this process without having stretched your brain and becoming, uh, you know, a better, more well-rounded person. And lastly, I asked him if he would ever consider standing again. Uh, never say never. Um, but at the moment, I've got uh, two really good reasons to get out of bed every morning. Uh, one is four years old, and he is uh, becoming an intelligent, articulate little toddler. And my other girl, who's eight months, is just learning how to crawl. Um, I want to stop solving the world's problems just for a moment uh, and just focus in on making sure that my, uh, my kids are well-placed, that they are well-rounded, that I'm uh, giving them as much love and attention as, uh, as a parent should. And that was Tamati Coffee, outgoing MP for Labour. Um, to, you kind of got to go out on your own terms, but uh, if you had lost the elections, you wouldn't have. Is that how it works? Well, I did lose an election um, right. back in '96, uh, back in '99, um, and you just have to suck it up, mate, because there's just no going back. You got to look out, look for a job. You got to do this, that, and the other thing. So at the end of the day, I mean, it's just a cycle. You know, it, a cycle stops for some people mm. and and a new cycle begins for the new people and and that's the way it is you just got to accept it mm. yeah don't don't get mad get even there's been a lot of talk um you know whether uh, chris hipkins will step down and who might replace him have you thought about that like who's is there any potentials i think he has to stay for now because there's no one else uh, there are people like grant robertson david parker 
but I'm not sure that they would, would want it. I think Grant's energy over the last year, you could tell he was sticking around to do the party a solid, but he'd kind of lost his passion uh, for the job. I think that's true of David Parker, and it's true of a long list of those returning uh, Labour MPs, even Andrew Little again. Mm. I don't think he would want to do do his party a solid and come back as as leader. So I think Chippy actually has to stick around for a little while yet uh, before he can hand it over to whoever's coming up through the ranks. What went wrong for Labour, though? Uh, oh, no, a number of things, but I think that I, I, I think over the, the, the three year cycle that they had a, a clear majority to do something. And it was like a possum caught in the in the headlights, doesn't know whether to go this way or that way. Bugger it! I think I'll just stay and get run over. And that, and that's what and that's what's happened. Um, and and um, they they had a golden opportunity to do all sorts of things. I might not have agreed with them, but at least they would have had the the the, the wherewithal to do it. But in the end, they didn't, and they became what we're going to see under this lot. Uh, managerial capitalism, where they just manage on a day-to-day -day basis who gets five bucks, who gets ten bucks, and that, and we should be all right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what the country was was after. Because I can guarantee you that if they had a board in something like a wealth tax or, or a capital gains tax, um, yes, it would have shaken the right up. Mm. But it would have shaken the left up as well, and and also a lot of people in between, and there would have been a putia there to pay for a lot of other stuff, houses, infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, do you see any potential leaders, um, up and coming leaders in the Labour Party? Well, it's 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 interesting um, when you when you think of a leader, um, they don't arrive. Somebody else out of the blue uh, comes up. Look at Jacinda. Mm. Um, and 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 um, Godfrey's right. You know, you gotta you gotta have Chippy in there as a caretaker, just to look after the rubbish tins and the and the process. But at the end of the day, they better be quick about getting a leader for the next election. I actually heard Winston Peters uh, talking about how he'd been ignored by the media, so let's talk about Winston and New Zealand first. Do we have to? Even <laughs> though uh, there's not a lot to say because the all waiting till uh, November the 3rd, but how well did New Zealand First do? I mean, he's back. <laughs> he's back, so I guess he did well. Um, yeah, he, he ran a funny campaign, uh, I think. I think every time he probably runs quite a funny campaign because it's always different, you know, he's always targeting someone different. Um, this time he was targeting, you know, people who weren't in a mood for change, but people who were angry, mm. people who were angry about, I don't know, the vaccine or they were angry about the lockdowns. Uh, or they were angry about the taxes they paid. Uh, who knows what they were angry about? We just know they were angry. And Winston understood uh, that they were angry, and you know he judged it right again. He got his five percent. Uh, that's all he needs to probably be um, the guy who will put National and Act in power. So. Not many others, if any, is that the saying, uh, have been part of a coalition with Winston Peters, and you have. So, what might be happening now? Um, he he will be. Uh, tight-lipped, he will be saying to all and sundry, wait for the specials, uh, because that, and, and, and so there's that period, um, and I don't know why, in 2023, we're waiting till the 4th of November, for goodness sake. It's only the 17th of October, and we have to wait two more weeks before somebody counts? Goodness gracious, how backward are we? Anyway, he, he he will um, be positioning himself as as a person who is needed, you know. He he always does this, and he's clever. He's the only one that can can do it. He's the only one that ne can negotiate a deal from nothing. I mean, he already, you know, even before he was back in Parliament, he started negotiating. He started setting the the boundaries. And, and um, I certainly think that it was a mistake for Luxon to not rule him out. Um, because n now look at what you've got. Because he ruled him in. Because he ruled him in, yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, three or four weeks about how and who and what uh, becomes our government. Who's in charge in the next three weeks? Uh, well, nominally... Um 
we still have a Labour government just under the caretaker convention. So they make decisions, uh, you know, they sign contracts that need to be signed, but they don't make any major policy decisions. So nothing really changes uh, until uh, Luxon's sworn in as Prime Minister and he wins his first confidence vote, which I think has to be taken the 21st of December as the deadline yeah. uh, for that. What's the danger of having 61 seats? Well, the danger is Only. you have um, someone like Dr Sharma uh, you know, because National, it's, there were people, I was with Simon Bridges on the night, uh, and there were people in National, and he was saying, who the hell is that guy? Um, and, you know, uh, Luxon will be saying the same thing. His MPs will be walking into caucus. Uh, he'll be whispering to Nicola Willis, who's that? What's their <laughs> name? Um, so you, you need a bit of a so you, <laughs> yes. so, so, so you need a bit of a buffer. Yeah, you yeah. need a buffer, because one of the, there might be a blow up. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. agree? How many would be safe? Oh, look, the, 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 key, the key to um, Nationals' survivability is exactly what they've done in the last three years. Their discipline has been very, very good, and that's why they look like a cohesive, uh, a, a cohesive bunch of people. And I think that will continue. There's, there's something about power, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, uh, how to hold on to it. Don't go all stupid and ropey. Mm. Um, you know, and, and so I, I'm, not, I'm not expecting um, anyone to jump out of the, the cot and dance around the fireplace. You know, Go it's just not going to happen. Tēnā kōrua, um, he, he, he rawe i nei kōrero, ko huri te tai, ko whāringa te hua, tēnei tātou e kauana i ngā kōrepo, ko te puna hohonu o wānanga te wai ora. Ka nui te mihi ki te puna whakatongarewa, me te māngai pāho. Thank you, my guests. Nō mai.